I hope and pray that all of you are doing well this morning. We will enter our Bible study together. We are looking at another one another sermon as we get going here this morning. We're going to consider one another really in a kind of a different way. We've looked at a lot of verses that say, love one another, pray for one another, serve one another, be humble, uh, don't be high-minded, uh, consider yourselves lower than the rest who are around you. Those are all brilliant statements in Scripture that we can look at and consider. But there's also the other side. There's a lot of verses in the Bible that says, don't do this to each other. Don't, don't behave this way. This is bad. This is, these are worldly things. These are things you shouldn't be involved in as Christians, as disciples of Christ, as servants of the Most High God. And so we'll look at that as we consider one another. Certainly, we're, we're thinking about our brethren, those that we serve with, those that we love and care about so dearly. But we want to look at the things that we should not do. And I was very tempted to, to title this sermon, Do Not Sue One Another, because that's really how this begins for us. Don't, don't go to court against your brother or against your sister in Christ. It is absolutely wrong to do that. But before 1 Corinthians 6 begins, we want to settle in with this Corinthian church to know what Paul is saying to them, the challenges that they face. This is a body of Christ. They belong to God, and yet they're in trouble. They have a lot of things that are going on that should not be going on. Paul's dealing with issues that have sprung up in the church in Corinth. They're divided. Remember chapter 1, they're divided among themselves. There's carnality. Paul says, when I came to you, I fed you with milk and not solid food. And he says, you're still carnal. I still can't tell you the deeper things of God because you're still working out your lives in a fleshly sense. God is spirit, and you are spiritual beings. You are in Christ, and you are to see the world and your life through what the Spirit has revealed. Let go of the carnal. I have to speak to you with milk still. And then in chapter 5, he says there's immorality in the church, and not only have you not dealt with it the way that you should, but you're puffed up about it because you've allowed it to continue. And so he corrects them in that. And in chapter 6, as, as much as we'd want to come up for air and take a break and talk about the good heavenly things that God has for us. We're not there yet. In chapter 6, there's still another issue. They have filed lawsuits against one another. And I think something else that we don't want to forget is, as we enter into this, that in the one another theme and thread that we're considering, Paul loves this, this church. He's not eager to write these things so he can tear into them and make them feel bad for the way that they're behave, behaving because in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, when he, when he writes the follow-up letter in verse 4, he says, Out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. And so keep that in mind too. As he writes these things, he's crying. He's broken. This, when he left them after sharing the gospel with them and them obeying the gospel, he had such high hopes for them. And so when he writes to them, there's tears on the page as he writes to them. His care and his love is so abundant and he wants them to know that. But here in chapter 6, he's going to challenge them with some important questions about their behavior. And in the same chapter, as we go through this together, he's going to say to them that there's great things about their spiritual lives. There's, there's a contrast you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing this. Do you not know these things? And then towards the end, he says to them, you are the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. Wow. What an amazing contrast. You are Christians. You are believers. God is doing something in your life. Turn away from the carnal. Go to the greater. I beg you, do this for your own good. Do this in your service to God. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1 begins by saying, dare any of you. What an amazing way to start a chapter. Dare any of you. Having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. He's basically saying to them, how dare you go to a godless heathen court when you should have settled the issue, whatever it might be, with your brother or with your sister. How, why is this happening? How did this come about? And please be thinking about this for us in our lives. How does it come about? Because brethren do file lawsuits against brethren. 
There are real issues that can't be settled, and there are things that we say, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm going to have to file a lawsuit. I don't know what else to do. This brother or sister is not honoring God's law. I have been, I have been offended. I have been wronged. This must be settled in court. And so it's not just the Corinthian church. It's members of the Lord's church that get into situations where they say, I think I know how to solve this. I will take them to court, and we will duke it out in the legal system. And he's saying to those who would say such things, let me get this straight. I want to make sure I understand what's being said. You have a matter against a brother or a sister in Christ, and your first thought is to take them to court. Do you not know that each one of you belong to Christ? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, he says, but of him. This is the same group of people. He says, but of him, of God, you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You are redeemed. You're sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We belong to God. And now they've got this inner issue going on between them where they've decided to go out to someone who doesn't even believe in God to settle an issue between them. And so it makes sense that he says, dare any of you how dare you take such a drastic step? Taking care of an issue between Christians must be done in the Spirit of Christ. It must be done Christ's way. Look at Matthew 18. Jesus has already told us how to deal with these things amongst brethren. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 15, Jesus says, Moreover, if your brother, here we are, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector, not in any way does Jesus say, well, then you run out of options, take them to court. Let, let a worldly judge decide what to do. Never. Why? Because it's your brother and there is only love one for another. We are to love one another. Jesus gives us the, the way to do it. And what does he say? Go to him. Go to your brother. Make it as personal as you can. Do it privately for the sake of your brother. See, you, you save him any grief and any embarrassment for the way that he's behaved or the way that she's behaved if it, if it can be settled between me and them or you and them. They're spared of any embarrassment. And you've done that because you love them. Imagine Christians going to court and it is now public knowledge that it can be written about in the newspapers that you think this is the way to fix matters within the body of Jesus Christ. How dare you? Please don't forget this lesson because you will get hurt. You will be offended. There will be a brother or sister who will wrong you. It happens all the time. As much as we don't want it to, it happens all the time. What is my role in this? What should I do? It is not to take them to court. That is an awful thing, and it is not my place. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, here's the first do you not know. These questions are rhetorical. He's saying, I know that you know. Because you know this, and then he'll move on. But, but the question is asked on purpose. Do you not know? Remember, Jesus does that with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the elders, the doctors of the law. He says to them the one thing that would offend them the most. Have you not read? Nothing stings more than that. All I do is read. And Jesus says, have you not read the word of God? Because it tells us. And so the, the, the message is the same here. Do you not know? We see it first in verse 2. Look at verse 3. Do you not know? Look at verse 9. Do you not know? Look at verse 15. Do you not know? Look at verse 16. Or do you not know? Verse 19. Or do you not know? He says it six times in this chapter. He is very hurt by their actions and by the way that they are behaving. Don't you know this? Come on. This is the way we address our kids. Did you not know the rules? Did you not know that you couldn't do this? 
My dad used to say to me, did you not know that you're not allowed to play with matches on the carpet of our home? As I'm standing there with a, a match in my hand. Huh? Did you not know? Is this, was this not made clear to you, son? It's a rhetorical question. It brings us somewhere. Of course you know. Why are you doing this? And so it's not just a matter of saying, look, let's read through 1 Corinthians 6. Let's understand it so we can pass a test or academically understand what it means. He's saying you do know where you're lacking is in the application of what you know. You see, for us as Christians, we come in and we study it and we go, amen, that's exactly right. The next step is work it out practically in your life. Because if you don't, then you simply just know. You're not doing it. And God's Word is not given to us simply to know something. It's to say, oh, oh, this matters to me. This decides how I should move forward. Do you not know? These things were given to you. And look what he says. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world and if the world will be judged by you? Are you unworthy to judge the smallest of matters? This is a statement that blows my mind. In what way are we to judge the world? He said in 1 Corinthians 5, I don't judge people out in the world. That, that's none of my business. We're talking about what happens in the body of Christ. This we can pass judgment and make judgment on. It, to, to judge everyone in the world would mean we have to go out of the world. And Paul says we can't do that. So, so forget that. Let's judge correctly the things that are in the house of God. And now he says we will judge the whole world. How can that be? Psalm 149, a very, very interesting passage. Psalm 149. I'm just going to read it for you. I'm not going to commentate. I just want you to consider what is said here. The judgment of the world by the saints of God. Psalm 149 and verse 5. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment, this honor have all his saints, praise the Lord. The saints will judge the nations. This honor has been bestowed on the saints by Almighty God. Could it not be, brethren, that because we have heard and obeyed the truth, the written word, that's what Psalm 149 said, the judgments that are written, We've applied those to ourselves, and so judgment has been passed. We've accepted that, and we've abided in the, in the written law and the Word of God. And by our acceptance in this day and age, we are judging the world. The, the law, the judgment comes from God, not from us. And yet, because we understand His judgment and we walk in that, that is judgment, isn't it? How many people are offended by you being a Christian or by your high standard of living? How many people are offended by that? Well, they feel judged by you. You can't judge me. That happens, that is said all the time. I'm not judging you. I'm living my life as a Christian as God says that I should and I'm sharing something good with you that you should know. And in that sense, judgment is passed. There will be those in the world who followed and obeyed God's word and so judgment is applied to those who refuse to accept it. That's God's doing. It is interesting, though, if you're going to be set in this position, this lofty position of judgment over the world, why would you go to the world to judge anything for you? It doesn't make any sense. Get your head on straight. That can't be right. You're not ready to judge the world if you can't judge matters amongst brethren. Look, look at what he's saying. You're having trouble in Corinth, and yet you're going to judge the world? You can't get Corinth straightened out? And even smaller than that, you can't get the church in Corinth to get straightened out? How is it that you would go to a civil court to have your matters dealt with by those in the world? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Oh man, I had trouble giving you how the first one, what that meant. I'm really in trouble now. Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? 
let, let me share with you that the, the, all I can gather is it's fallen angels. The judgment, the word of God, the standard never changes. And there are angels, Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, angels who sinned and were cast down to hell and delivered into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Jude tells us the same thing in verse 6. Angels who left their own abode and are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day, that our obedience to God would be a judgment unto them. Angels abandoned God's word and will. that they, they went off, they left their proper abode. We have stayed in the light that God has provided. And in that sense, we judge angels. I don't see how us, earthly beings who walk in the light and serve God, could be brought into heaven to straighten out heavenly issues amongst faithful angels. I don't know how they would need to be straightened out and how we would be able to do that. But it does make sense to the degree that those that have fallen, we bear witness against them that there is a proper way to live. Think about your life, that there are angels that exist that judgment will come from us upon them. Because you're a Christian, because you love God, because you've accepted what Christ has done for you, that God places you in a position of judgment over angels. We're told in the Psalms that God has made us a little lower than the angels. And yet, think this through with me. God has given to us a distinct place in the heavenly realm that only we can fit into, only we belong in. And so God, by His authority, can say to us, you will judge angels. Okay. Okay. If that is God's will, then I need to be prepared to do that. And so think about the, the position we're given by God through the blood of His Son and now we have an issue within the church that brethren are fighting. How embarrassing. How embarrassing that would be for us. The point is, whether I fully understand this passage or not, the point is, since the judgment is given to the saints at some point in the future, it's embarrassing that we would need help from unbelievers in matters between brethren. We see that, we see Paul say that in verse 4. Look at verse 4. If then you have judgment concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? Why would you go to someone who's least esteemed by the church to judge a matter within the church? Look down at verse 5. I say this to your shame. Correction needs to be applied. They need to be straightened out in this matter. And he is saying, shame on you. This is the apostle who brought them the truth and who rejoiced in their obeying that gospel and, and being saved. And now he's, again, remember, with tears and anguish. Shame on you. Don't act this way. Don't be like this. You're supposed to be light to the world. You're supposed to be salt to the earth. And when you're fighting just like the world does, that, there's nothing there but shame. I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? Can we find a faithful member in the church who loves both parties where, where the issue exists, who loves both parties and wants the very best outcome of this? Of course we can. Look in this room, in this group that we have here. Is there a brother or sister in Christ who is wise among us? Is there someone that I can go to? I hope you know the answer to that. Someone who loves me and loves the person who is the issue with me. That they can sit between us and arbitrate properly and appropriately with and by the Word of God to settle the issue between brethren. Of course there is. Find them. Go to them. Do not go to a court of law. I should say too that Sorting out matters between brethren can be a grueling task. It hurts and it's damaging to sit and to listen to brethren air out their laundry, to talk about the issues, when they started, how they've developed, how awful it's gotten, and what the answer is to that. It is so hard. It is so hard. In the situations that I've been brought in to help deal with such matters, my heart and my statement to them is always, let's get out of this as quick as we can. We spent too long in this mire. This is dangerous. It's poisonous. 
and it affects us in such a terrible way. But let, let's just agree that we're going to come out of this together and we're going to be on God's side, all of us. Because this is not healthy. That's why you brought me in here. Because you know this isn't healthy. Everyone has been injured by this. It is a grueling task and I don't ever want to make light of that. In verse 6, he says, But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. We're not unbelievers, we're believers. We are the seed of Abraham, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. We are the seed of Abraham. Remember what Jesus said about your father Abraham when he was speaking to the Jews? He says to them, Abraham's not your father, though by lineage he is, he's not your father because you've heard the word of God and you refused it. Abraham heard the word of God from God's messenger and he accepted it. Because you refuse the word of God, you are not Abraham's children. Can I show you something Abraham did? Just, just think about taking your brother to law and saying it in the same breath, I am a child of Abraham. Now let's go to court so I can sue you. Look at what happens in Genesis chapter 13. God is so brilliant. I wonder, you know, why did he share this with us? Why did he tell us about this moment? There's always a reason. God always has a reason. We're talking about brethren, brothers, sisters in Christ, should not sue one another. And in Genesis chapter 13, look at verse 2. Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Man, what it would be like to be overloaded with silver and gold. That'd be awesome. Oh, oh yeah, okay, back to the point. He's overloaded with silver and gold. Verse 5, Lot also, who went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. They are both overloaded with wealth. Verse 6, Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of, life, of Lot's livestock. The, the Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. It's not the whole land before, is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. He gives Lot the choice. He says, look, there's a lot of property out here. The land we're on cannot handle us both. Our herdsmen are fighting between each other. And he says to, to Lot, this can't go on. Why? Because we're brethren. You notice it's almost out of place there that it says at the bottom of verse 7, the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. These are heathens. They don't believe in God. What does it matter? Why is that written there? The Perizzites and the Canaanites are there in the land. Because Lot and Abraham are fighting in this moment, they can't get things straight amongst their own family. And Abraham knows and understands that if we continue to have these battles between us, that we will be a bad influence to the unbelieving world that dwells here with us. You pick. You see what he said? He didn't say, I've chosen the good land with all the water. Lot's going to do that. He says to Lot, you decide. Abraham is the eldest. He gets first choice. He gives it to Lot. Understand, he had the right to say, go over there and don't come back. I'm the patriarch. He didn't use that against Lot. He said, we're brethren. You pick. Wherever you go, I'll go the other way. Don't you see that? Don't you want to be a child of Abraham? Don't you want to be of the seed of Abraham? Then you have to be ready to do this. Though you have every right. Though you're right on every level. It doesn't matter because you're brethren. And Paul is going to tell them that as we move through this passage, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 7. Now therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept the wrong? See, it's right there. Why don't you just accept the wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and you cheat and you do these things to your brethren. He just told them, be like Abraham. Just accept the wrong. Let them do what they're going to do. Jesus said the same thing to us when Matthew read for us from Matthew chapter 5. If someone slaps you in the face, 
Everyone here as a Christian knows the answer to what you do next. The Holy Spirit of God says, turn the other cheek and let them have that one as well. That is hard to do. I'm not even waiting for the slap. If someone's hand comes back, my hands are coming up. I, I'm going to do my best to block that. I don't, I don't want any part of that. You know, I have teeth. I have glasses on. I'm important. I'm fragile. There's a lot of things flying through my mind when someone goes like this. But Jesus says, take this on for size. Try this out. You want to look like God? You want to be God? You want to be like God? Let someone hit you in the face. Has God done that? He's done it over and over and over again for those whom He loves. And when it's our turn, we can look like God to accept the wrong. To pray to God for that brother or sister who has wronged us, that God would save their soul. And to stay focused on the goal. The goal is not to win in court. The goal is to go to heaven and to be with Almighty God for eternity. He says to them, if you go to court, you are an utter failure. You see, going to court knowing you have a good case, you have already lost spiritually. Paul makes that clear. You've already failed. I don't care what it's about. When you go to court, you are a loser in spiritual terms because you have gone off into the world to get something you think belongs to you. It is better to give it up. Let them have it. And that's going to sting. That's going to hurt. You're going to be angry. Sort it out. Work through it. Follow the principles that Jesus has given to you and be a better person. I can't control that other person, but I would sure like to think that if, if I let them, if I accepted that wrong, that maybe somewhere down the road they would say, you know, there's something special about Christianity. I don't know that. I can't make them think that. But for me to accept the wrong and to go home and just continue to live my life knowing they intentionally hurt me, that maybe I am a piece that God wants to use to soften their heart. I don't know. It doesn't matter. My job is to do what God has told me to do. But I sure would hope that they would come to know the Lord and that we would be called brethren once again. That would be the greatest thing that could happen. Do you not know, verse 9, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicator, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. He goes through this list. Don't you know? I told you these things. Don't you know that this group of people, those who practice such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God? And look what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You were involved in all of these things, but you repented of those things. You have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are a new creature in God by His design. Now please act like it. Work that out and see what it really means for your life and for your soul. Don't just know it. Do it. It is vitally important for us to know what He is saying to them. Look at verse 15 with me. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 15. Do you not know? Now, now we're starting to make a turn here to the glorious truth about who you are as a Christian. We, we've already worked out all of the shameful things that we should not be doing. We've corrected ourselves in that. And, and now there's a transition. I don't want you to miss it. There's a transition where he's going to tell us by the Spirit of God who you are in sight of heaven. Got to take hold of this. Verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Look at verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Do you think about yourself in that way? That because you're joined to the Lord, you are one spirit with Jesus Christ and with Almighty God. You're not just a Christian. You're not just coming to church. You are one spirit. 
with Almighty God, all-knowing, all-powerful, the Creator of all things, heaven and earth. You are one with Him in the Spirit because of the work of Jesus Christ. And His work and His purpose in you is to reach the lost and to save those who are perishing. But here we are in 1 Corinthians 6, fighting with each other in matters of this life. In this fighting, we are trying to bring the Savior of the world into our temporal and vain concerns. You are one spirit with Almighty God. Think about what that means when we drag Him into a public court, into a civil court. I'm such a good Christian that I have to file this lawsuit, take my brother or sister in Christ to court, and God's going to go with me. He's on my side. Is that really what you want? It's a shame. How dare you? We're the, we're the words that were used in this type of behavior. And we've got to take note of that. Why? Why is it important? My feelings are hurt. I've been wrong. It's important because you are one with the Spirit of God. God has declared it to be tr true. And if you believe that, and I know that you do, then we've got to walk that out in our lives. Be one spirit with God. Look at verse 19. We want to end in a beautiful and a powerful place. Do you not know? Get ready. Because this means you do. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You have been purchased with a price. What was that price? All of you know the answer to this. What was the price that was paid? It was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Peter says, not gold and silver, the things that men make deals with, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, you have been purchased. You, brothers and sisters, as I look out to you this morning, you are the temple where the Holy Spirit of God dwells. Can you imagine the temple, the Shekinah glory, the presence of God rests and abides in your frame? Don't take that temple to a place it shouldn't be. Don't walk into a place where filthy things are happening. Don't take your temple in front of a computer screen and try to bring the Lord into something that you long to look at, the carnal part of you longs to look at. God has no place or part with wickedness. We can't either. You are the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. When we behave in such ways, when we do wicked things, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Grieved. He is weeping over us because we've been purchased at a price the blood has been shed. You are important. You are special. You are holy. You are God's child. And you are where the Holy Spirit dwells. Think about what he's saying. You are a temple. You are a sacred abode. You are a divine dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. The word temple of the Holy Spirit, as it is written here, is the same word for the Jewish temple. It is the entire consecrated enclosure of the temple. This includes the holy place and yes, the holy of holies. No one in the Old Testament was allowed into the holiest of all except one, the high priest, who came in with blood because he could not stand before the presence of God without blood for the forgiveness of his own sins and forgiveness of the sins of the people. No one could go in there. Anyone who was not the high priest at that time, the son of Aaron, who dared go in there would die instantly. They could not stand in the presence of God. That is the Old Testament. And here in the New, the Word of God by God's will says, you are that temple. Evil can't come in here. It's an abomination to God. It must die when it comes too close to me because I am the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. Do you think of yourself that way? Do you get caught up in conversations? It's not just a matter of suing someone. Well, it's, it's far less than that for us, isn't it? It's shooting off an email with hurtful words. It's saying something publicly in a public forum about a brother or sister in Christ who you're just sick and tired of, so you're just going to let brethren know about that. That's wrong. Go help somebody. Why are you so angry? Go minister to someone who needs God's love. 
Stop wasting your time in carnal things. You are the temple. The calling and the charge is so high for us. And how many times do I find ourselves in sin and doing things that we shouldn't? How many times have I read an email from a brother and I want to add his tone so I can make it say what I want it to say? You ever had that when someone says, hey, come read this email and tell me what this guy is trying to say to me? And so you go and you read the email and it says, do you want to go to lunch at noon? I don't know. I guess he wants you to go to lunch at noon. No, no, no. Look, look at what it says. Do you want to? He's saying that I'm always the one who picks. Can't you see that? <laughs> Sorry. No. We do that, don't we? Why? Because the carnal is still there and we should be fighting that with everything we have. Do not tie a harlot to Jesus Christ. Treat the temple as God's holy place. Let's be doing that as we enter our Bible studies here in just a few moments to remember who you are before God. You are the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. It is so precious and there are so few on the earth who take hold of that truth. You're a royal priesthood, a zealous and special people who are looking, anxiously looking for good works that you might walk in those good works because God has prepared them beforehand. If there's anyone here who needs to obey the gospel, that invitation always goes out. You know that if you've been here. We want you to obey the gospel. We want you to be a Christian, to know what it means to have a life that is wholesome and healthy and godly. God has given it to us because He loves us. If you want to take that on in your life, confess the name of Jesus Christ, have your sins forgiven and washed away through baptism, that can happen right now. If you remember the Lord's Church, you need the help of the brethren here. Maybe there's something that's happening in your life. You need help. God's given us the church so that help can be provided. If we can help in any way, come forward while together we stand and sing.